Hi all, so we're going to carry on with our analysis of A Christmas Carol. We got to the top of page 20, uh, 28 last time, so let's just recap. Um, this point on the 20, page 27, the ghost of Christmas present um, starts to take Scrooge to Scrooge's Clark's house. Um, so we know that is Bob Cratchit, it says here Bob Cratchit's dwelling. Okay. So we looked at the top of page um, 28 um, and... Uh, the ghost of Christmas present was sprinkling um, this kind of incense um, on Bob's house. Um, and really the idea here, let's just recap our notes, was that the, the ghost of Christmas present, remember he only lives for one day, he's like the embodiment of the Christmas spirit, values everyone and he thinks especially the poor are worthy and in need. Um, and he then really opposes Dickens, um, or Dickens is really opposing, sorry, Malthus's beliefs. Remember Thomas Malthus? Um, who was really against the poor, um, wanted them to um, not have children so that the sort of poor would die out um, and would prevent the um, rapid rise, you know, continuing rise in the population. So this bit is all about Bob Cratchit's house. Um, and you might not have room to write it there, but we can write it on the next page. But if you have, you could write Bob Cratchit's house there as a as a little reminder. Um, so we're going to carry on reading from The Nut Rose. The Nut Rose Mrs Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons which are cheap and make goodly show for sixpence. And she laid the cloth assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, whilst Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property conferred upon his son and heir in honour of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find him so gallantly attired and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the bakers they'd smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced around the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes came bubbling up, knocking loudly, knocked loudly at the saucepan to be let out and peeled. Um, so there's loads that we can write about here. We've firstly got Mrs. Cratchit. She's in a twice turned gown. Um, so what this means is she's actually remade her dress twice. She sort of almost um, turned it round or turned it inside out and um, taken it apart and remade. Um, so this kind of uh, a remade dress. She hasn't um, got the money for um, new clothes, so she's remade her dress, maybe sort of turned the material around so that um, the worn out bits are, um, are not showing or something like that. Um, but she's brave in ribbons which are cheap and make a goodly show. Um, so this is reminding us that they're poor, um, but also this kind of optimistic as well. Um, you know, she wants to look good and um, she's joining into the sort of celebration. She's putting on a nice outfit um, and she's trying to make a good show, um, even though they don't really have money. Um, so she's not sort of moaning about her situation. Um, her daughter is the same and the son master, um, Peter, is borrowing his father's shirt. Um, so he's in um, borrowed clothes as well. But he's obviously wearing his father's shirt, so he looks smart for Christmas Day. Um, the younger ones are full of excitement. They come tearing in, screaming outside from outside. So we've got this sense of excitement here. Um, and again, we've got um, images of dancing and warmth. Um, and even the um, potatoes are knocking loudly at the saucepan lid. So... Um, We've got this kind of personification of the potatoes. Uh, wanting to be included or invited into the party. So you can just note in there, wanting to be included or invited in. So this is a house where people want to be. Um, again, direct opposite to Scrooge's house. Even the potatoes want to join in the celebration. 
"'What has ever got your precious father, then?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. Um, "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are,' said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet with officious zeal. "'We'd a deal of work to finish up last night,' replied the girl. "'I had to clear away this morning, mother.' "'Well, never mind, so long as you are come,' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'Sit ye down by the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless ye.'" So we can see, um, again, these images of fire. The girl had to work on Christmas morning, uh, but she's not complaining. Um, and again, this idea of being a very loving family and caring, her taking off her shawl and bonnet. Um, so all these things we can just note, little comments, um, love, um, care and support. Um, the motif of the fire. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came Bob, the little little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him, and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and tiny Tim upon his shoulder, Alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Um, so it's interesting the way he kind of um, uh, puts Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. He kind of almost just sort of celebrating him, um, despite the fact that he's disabled. So if you note there that he's sort of celebrating um, disability, he's kind of celebrating Tiny Tim's life despite the fact that he's disabled. Um, and again, the children are playing games. So it, there's this sense of excitement and fun and happiness. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob with a sudden de uh, declension in his high spirits. For he had tiny Tim's been ti Tim's blood horse all the way from church and had come home rampant, not coming upon Christmas Day. Martha didn't like to see him disappointed. If it were only a joke, she came out prematurely from behind the closed closet door and ran into his arms while the two crutches hustled tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. Um, so again, look, even the pudding is singing this personification. Um, and we've got a really important image of family here. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs Cratchit uh, when she had rallied Bob on his cred uh, credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in church because he was a cripple and it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Um, now you might remember this line from the film as well. So here we've got Tiny Tim and he's such an important character. But he's like forever optimistic. forever the optimist um, he's disabled the likelihood is that he's going to die but actually um, he's glad that he's disabled um, because it's he thinks it's going to be a chance for people to remember Jesus um, Um, because Jesus made lame beggars walk and blind men see and so they think the fact that they see him as a cripple it will help them remember kind of um, Jesus's miracles um, he doesn't focus on the negative he doesn't um, get worn down he's not angry about how um, he's disabled um, but he even still finds a, a way to say actually you know this is a good thing and um, what can other people um, benefit um, so the other idea here is then is that he's very selfless. He puts others first. Um, 
um, for himself rather than um, being so pessimistic about his situation. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this and trembled more when he said that tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. So we know that he's sort of trying to convince himself and it's not really the case. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor and back came tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool before the fire, while Bob, turning up his cuffs as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being more, made more shabby, shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued, ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenom phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs Cratchit made the gravy ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the um, apple sauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouth, lest they should shriek for goose uh, before their turn came to be helped. So here we've got a really important image again of family, um, of teamwork um, and of togetherness. And this is in direct contrast to the um, isolation and loneliness of Scrooge. Um, so we can note there that it juxtaposes Scrooge's loneliness. And what Dickens wants us to see is that, okay, these people don't have very much, um, but they make the most of what they have got. And um, actually, they are happier um, with no money, uh, but with each other than Scrooge is happy, uh, than Scrooge is with his um, plenty of money, um, but nobody to share it with. At last the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause and Mrs Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board. And even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there was um, such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular was steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Now, the first thing to remember is um, they've got a goose because it's cheap, okay? Um, not a turkey. They can't afford a turkey. And this is an important image um, and moment because it um, contrasts with what we know happens at the end in stage five when Scrooge then buys them a big turkey. Um, the, they're buying the goose because it's cheap. Um, now they sort of eke it out with apple sauce, which means to sort of make it last or make it go further. So really what that's telling us is they only have a little bit of meat and um, there's kind of more applesauce on mashed potatoes on their plate than meat. But they, they fill their plate with the kind of cheaper things. And it's not a great dinner. It's sufficient. Sufficient really, you know, telling us that it's it's just enough. There's nothing left over. And then uh, Mrs. Gratchit said with great delight that they hadn't ate it all at last. But actually all that's left is one small atom of a bone. Now a bone is inedible anyway um, and an atom is obviously such a tiny um, part so really they've, they have eaten it all um, you know there's nothing left
Um, so it's saying yet everyone had had enough. So it's probably just that they're, they're not hungry anymore, um, but there's certainly nothing, not lots to go around. And again, what's important here is not that they just don't have a lot of food, but actually they're making the best of this situation and they're still celebrating what they've got rather than um, thinking about what little they have. They're focused on what, um, what they do have and making the most of what they have got. So now they're moving on to pudding. Um, and Mrs. Crutchet is sort of worried because she wants it to be a, a great occasion. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello! A great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry's cook next door. Pastry cooks next door to each other, with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered, flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half um, of half a quartern of ignited brandy and, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Um, so again, we've got this kind of um, celebration of food. And that is mainly because they don't have a lot. So then, um, you know, they really make the most of what they've got. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she could confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat hairs, uh, heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. So actually, the fact is, is that it is a small pudding for a large family, but they're too polite. So if we just highlight the end of that bit there. And the last bit on this page. Nobody said or thought it was a small pudding for a large family. Um, So even though it is, um, there's not enough to go round, but they don't complain. So just in the way that Tiny Tim is this kind of symbol of optimism, so is the Cratchit family as a whole. They're a symbol, um, of hope, I guess, as well. Um, and in that, they're kind of are the embodiment um, of Jesus Christ. Because they're symbolizing this hope. They never, they never moan. Even the whole thing with the pudding, she's sort of hoping that it's going to be as great as it can be rather than um, just sort of being all negative and complaining the whole time. So we can talk about Tiny Tim as a symbol of hope and his optimism um, specifically, um, but we can talk about the Cratchit family as a whole as this sort of symbol of hope and the embodiment of Jesus Christ, despite the fact that they are the kind of poor ones rather than the rich ones. They are the ones who are really... Um, living God's word and here they explain why they you know no one's thinking or saying those things they're saying it would be heresy to do so they would have blushed to hint at such a thing so they they don't want to sort of embarrass anyone they know it's the wrong thing to say and um, so they they don't say it at last dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up, the compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, apples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob called a circle, meaning half a one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. So they haven't even got enough um, kind of cups to go round, um, they've got a, an old jug, um, and you know two two mugs um, and then they're going to share their drink 
These held the hot stuff from the jug, um, however, as well as the golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. Um, and this line will come back, okay? Um, God bless us, everyone. Um, so it's this idea that God does not judge. Um, whether you're poor or rich, everyone is kind of deserving of God's love. Um, now, this is an important message for Tiny Tim, you know, being um, disabled. Um, but it's also a reminder that actually... Um, God will bless Scrooge as well um, if he, um, you know, asks for forgiveness. Um, so let's also just note here the idea of the, the drink. And again, what he says is that they, they held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done. OK, so it doesn't matter whether you've got a fancy um, glass cup um, or just a, um, a custard cup without a handle. Um, it's not the um, object that matters. Um, so this idea of um, them not being materialistic. Materialistic means like thinking about um, objects, um, you know, putting your, your focus on having more stuff, having things, um, possessions. Um, and this, this is not the focus for this family. What's more important is the, um, the moment. Um, that kind of celebrating as a family. So Tiny Tim has said, God bless us, everyone, um, and then we can carry on. He sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. Bob held his withered little hand as his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge, with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. So this is a really important point. It even says with an interest he had never felt before. So this is a real symbol that he, that he um, is changing. And the fact that he wants to know if Tiny Tim will live, again, it's this idea that Tiny Tim um, represents hope. Um, but also it shows us that um, he's starting to care. Um, Tiny Tim also really represents all of those who are marginalised in society. If you think about a margin is on the edge of your page, all of those who are pushed to the edge of society, all those who, um, you know, aren't cared about. Um, so we can write a little note here. If I put TT for Tiny Tim. Represents those marginalized in society the people that society forgets about who we need so you know that would be the same today like um the elderly the homeless um those families that are struggling um and again you know if you think about you see a lot of adverts on the tv at christmas time about don't forget these people help them out um and tiny tim being disabled um represents the same kind of message I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost, in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. So this is the kind of first big warning to Scrooge after Jacob Marley arrives, um, that, that it, Scrooge has the power to change this. Um, that if Scrooge doesn't do anything, um, then he will be responsible for Tiny Tim's death. No, no, said Scrooge. Oh, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race, returned the ghost, will find him here. What then? 
If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Scrooge hung his head to hear his own words quoted by the spirit and was overcome with penitence and grief. So let's just pick out a few bits here. Um, and then we can talk about these bits. So firstly, the ghost of Christmas present repeats the words that Scrooge said in stave one. Um, this idea of um, decrease the surplus population. And that's what um, Scrooge said to the portly gentleman. If he'd be like to die, he'd but if he's likely, that means if he's likely to die, he might as well get on with it, essentially, and decrease the surplus population. But this time Scrooge feels very different about it. We see that he hung his head to hear his own words. He was overcome with penitence and grief. grief. And penitence is really, um, means repentance, this idea of um, repenting, asking for forgiveness. So what we're really starting to see here is Scrooge's transformation. He's not yet translated any of this into action, um, but like we said, whereas ghost, um, the ghost of Christmas past um, gets the ghost get Scrooge to think about himself, um, now the ghost of Christmas present is getting Scrooge to think about others. So. Um, Let's just write a little note at the top there um, to remind us of that. So, Ghost of Christmas Present gets Scrooge to consider others. And you can put um, past ghost makes him reflect on self. So each ghost has a particular, you know, kind of role to play um, in Scrooge's transformation. Okay, um, so this is a real low point um, for Scrooge. Um, you might even want to note that there. Um, um, and what we're really seeing here is his sort of self-realisation um, at how harsh his words were. Um, he's probably feeling a certain amount of embarrassment and shame, you know, to sort of have that, um, well, that's the idea anyway that Dickens is trying to create um, to sort of embarrass him really man said the ghost if man you be in heart not adamant forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is will you decide what men shall live what men shall die it may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child Oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on um, the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. Now this is quite a complicated idea here, but let's just pick out the main bit. Main bit. It says, will you decide what men will live, what men shall die? It may be that in the sight of heaven you are more worthless and let, less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. So he's... um sort of pointing out that Scrooge is playing God by deciding who should live and who should die. Um, so, you know, if this line was to be said, there'd probably be quite an emphasis on this pronoun here. Will you, um, to emphasise the fact that actually it should be God um, who makes that decision. So really what we're being told here is... Um, that this reinforces this idea of Scrooge's own self-importance. Um, he's kind of playing God by saying who he thinks um, should live and who should die. Um, and that is certainly wrong. 
And really what the ghost is saying is he should discover like who are the surplus are, who who could be got rid of, who are the people that we don't want in this world. And that's what um, the ghost then picks up on. He says, it may be that in the sight of heaven, so in God's eyes, you, Scrooge, are more worthless and less fit to live than millions like this poor man's child. And actually, we know that Scrooge is more worthless. He is more worthless than Tiny Tim because um, Scrooge is um, old. He's not young. Um, he's very negative um, and pessimistic. Um, he's got no family who are going to miss him. He's got no friends who are going to miss him. Um, he's a sinner. We were told at the beginning that he was a sinner. Um, and his sins are kind of his um, greed and his avarice. Um, so we know he's avaricious. He's greedy. Um, he's a sinner. Um, he's not a believer, really. Um, he doesn't seem to have um, faith. Um, or if he does, you know, go to church, um, he doesn't kind of then practice what he, um, these ideas. Um, and so it's really this idea that he's unkind and uncaring. And these are all the things that would kind of make up his chain, all these qualities that um, he has, his selfishness. Um, so we can put um, opposes um, Tiny Tim and the Cratchit family. They are the ones who are worthy and Scrooge is worth less. So there's quite a lot um, uh, to note there, um, but this idea of him kind of playing God is also his abuse of his position in society. So we can add that little note here as well. Um, So he's using his kind of status um, to give him power rather than using his status, um, you know, to, to do good um, and have a sense of responsibility to others. So there's quite a lot there. That's a really important bit. Scrooge bent before the ghost's rebuke and trembling cast his eyes upon the ground. So again, it's a really interesting image here of him um, trembling um, and casting his eyes down. Um, so again, we've got this sense of shame um, and fear. But he raised them speedily on hearing his own name. name. So we're back to Bob's, um, the kind of image, the vignette. We're back to the scene. Mr. Scrooge, said Bob, I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, said Bob, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, said she, on which one drinks the health of such um, an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, was Bob's mild answer, Christmas Day. And again, this is really important because um, Bob's answer is mild. He doesn't get cross at his wife. Um, it's a house that's full of peace. Um, and goodwill. And again, this is part of the Christmas message. We all know that Scrooge is an odious, um, stingy, hard feeling unman, uh, unfeeling man. Um, but actually, um, Scrooge says he's the founder of the feast. He shows that he is grateful. and kind um, for, for what he has rather than again focusing on the negative um, 
and we have this sense of um, the children and Christmas Day being something um, special um, that needs to be kind of um, protected almost and kept safe, um, kind of revered really. Okay. So Mrs. Cratchit responds, I'll drink his health for your sake and the day, said Mrs. Cratchit, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. And actually the sad thing is, is that it's nothing further from, you know, couldn't be further from the truth. So um, this kind of bit has two um, effects here. Um, firstly, um, it's a reminder not to judge. Because actually Mrs. Cratchit has understood um, Scrooge to be very something very different from what he is. He's not um, merry and he's not happy. Um, it's also um, a reminder of how unfair it is. She feels like it's very unfair. Um, so she reminds us of the kind of unfairness and the inequality in life. The children drank the toast after her. It was the first of their proceedings which had no heartiness. Tiny Tim drank it last of all, but he didn't care twopence for it. Scrooge was the ogre of the family. The mention of his name cast a dark shadow on the party, which was not dispelled for full five minutes. After it had passed away, they were ten times, they were ten times merrier than before. From the mere relief of Scrooge the baleful being done with, Bob Cratchit told them he had a situation in his eye for Master Peter, which would bring him, if obtained, full five and sixpence weekly. The two young Cratchits laughed tremendously at the idea of Peter's being a man of business, and Peter himself looked thoughtfully at the fire from between his collars, as if he were deliberating what particular investments he should favour when he came into the receipt of that bewildering income. Martha was a poor apprentice at a milliner's, um, then told them what kind of work she had to do and how many hours she worked had to stretch and how she meant to lie abed tomorrow morning for a good long rest, tomorrow being a holiday she passed at home. Also how she had seen a countess and a lord some days before and how the lord was much about as tall as Peter, at which Peter pulled up his collar so high that you couldn't have seen his head if you had been there. All this time the chestnuts and the jug went round and round and by and by they had a song about a lost child travelling in the snow from Tiny Tim who had a plaintive little voice and sang it very well indeed. So again these images keep coming back of um, songs um, but we've also got them sort of working hard, um, how many hours she worked at a stretch um, and then contrasted with... Um, the lord and lady uh, or countess and a lord and um, so we've always got this um idea of the poor um and their hardship contrasted with the rich um and their luxury um but also this um idea that they celebrate regardless there was nothing high of high mark in this. They were not a handsome family. They were not well dressed. Their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty. And Peter might have known and very likely did the inside of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another and contented with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in their bright sprinklings of the spirit's touch at parting, torch at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them and especially on Tiny Tim until the last so here we can see content happy grateful despite the fact um, that they are poor okay we're going to stop there because we're going to move on to um, a new um, vignette a new scene at christmas time um, so we'll draw a line under there and then we will carry on um, with the next video